Right. Um, thank you all for uh, attending my talk this morning. Um, so my name is Nisha Houlihan. I'm a, a research scientist in IBM research in our Dublin lab here in Ireland. And on the AI privacy and security team, I work on differential privacy. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is our work in the area of privacy preserving machine learning, um, using the great power of scikit-learn and Python to help us on our way. So to begin with, um, the area of data privacy as we now know it can trace its origins back to about the 1960s. And a lot of tools and algorithms have been developed since then that have um, that are still in use to this day and are still very powerful for protecting data. But the, the ecosystem in which those techniques now reside have changed a lot in the last 20 years to the point where we now have a big risk of being able to link these anonymized data sets with external data sources and re-identifying individuals in, this anonym, in these anonymized data sets or exposing other sensitive attributes that we wouldn't have wanted to uh, originally. There are many examples of these kind of attacks happening out in the wild and I've, I've listed a couple of examples here. So in the first example with uh, Netflix, they published a data set of anonymized movie ratings for their Netflix prize competition. They wanted researchers to improve their recommendation algorithm and they gave them some, some data to, to use to help them. Um, but researchers were able to link it with the publicly available internet movie database and um, expose individuals in the, Netflix, in the Netflix data set and expose the, I guess, the more sensitive ratings that they would have given to Netflix that maybe they wouldn't have given to a public service like IMDB. In the AOL case then, they published a data set of anonymized internet search histories and reporters in the New York Times were able to dig into the data and re-identify one individual in the data set and expose her entire search history, which I'm sure for a lot of us would be quite a sensitive matter. And finally then the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission published a data set of anonymized taxi trip records a few years ago and a blogger was able to um, attack the data set and link it with photographs of celebrities getting into taxis in New York City and re-identify or link those records together and find out where the celebrities were traveling to and from and how much they tipped their driver. I think in this case it's uh, Bradley Cooper getting into, into a taxi in Manhattan. Um, so all of these are examples of data sets that were anonymized using traditional methods, published in the wild and then subsequently attacked. But the, um, the privacy risks of data extend far beyond these kind of examples. They extend to publishing simple statistics on databases um, and being able to do to run database reconstruction attacks on those statistics to uh, basically reconstruct the original data set. And it also extends to machine learning models, I guess more pertinent to this talk, where you can reverse engineer the machine learning model to find out information about the original training data set. So uh, following on from these, I guess the failings of traditional anonymization in the current world, the idea of differential privacy was first conceived in 2006. And the key idea of differential privacy is that we introduce random noise to blur the data in such a way that we preserve the privacy of individuals in the data set, but um, still allow population trends to be accurately observable. And the unique selling point of differential privacy is that it is future proof. And by future proof, I mean that there's no data set that can be published uh, tomorrow or in 10 years time that can undo the anonymization we've just applied. There's no data set that we could publish to undo the, the random noise that we've added. And that makes differential privacy the strongest privacy guarantee that we have at the moment. And that's why it's such a desirable area of research at the moment. And differential privacy also introduced the idea of a, a privacy budget being attached to queries. So we always talk about epsilon in differential privacy. And this epsilon is linked to the amount of privacy leakage that we get when we ask a query. Typically, when you have a data set, you want to limit the amount of privacy budget that can be spent or the amount of privacy that can be leaked. And that is encapsulated in this privacy budget. And it's very easy when you're running queries to keep track of the privacy budget and add them up um, to give a total privacy budget 
at the end of the privacy budget spend at the end of a, a series of queries. So to look at a, a kind of a simple schematic of, um, of this, if we have a sensitive data set from which we're looking to extract some kind of knowledge or information in a privacy preserving way, uh, which we then want to be able to pass on to a data analyst um, with, without uh, posing a threat to the individuals in the data set. Um, we can extend this uh, use case to a machine learning environment where we have a sensitive data set being fed into a machine learning or AI algorithm. And for privacy's sake, we're going to inject differential privacy in some way into the training process and then pass the trained algorithm onto the data analyst. And because of the guarantees of differential privacy, we know that there are mathematical guarantees on the amount that the data analyst can infer about individuals in the sensitive data set. And that gives us great comfort in being able to pass this information on to, a, to an external source whom, over, over whom we don't have any control. And at IBM Research, what we've done is we have built DiffPrivLib that does all the important stuff here in the middle. It does the machine learning with differential privacy built in. And that means that we can train machine learning models with differential privacy on sensitive data sets and then passing them on outside any uh, sensitive enclave or secure enclave to um, external parties. So our approach in building DiffPrivLib was to obviously to use Python, which is a very popular programming language for machine learning and data analytics. We wanted to use, I guess, the de facto standards in data analytics and machine learning that are NumPy and scikit-learn um, and build upon them to add our differential privacy capabilities. A core pillar of our work for DiffPrivLib was to um, ensure an almost identical user experience to that of NumPy and scikit-learn. And that extended to having a lot of default parameter settings for the privacy aspects of, of these functions to ensure that anybody who was familiar with NumPy and scikit-learn would automatically be familiar with DiffPrivLib before they even started using it. And I think by and large, we've, we've achieved that goal, um, which you'll see shortly, I'm sure. So in a nutshell, uh, here we have some uh, a quick code snippet, which again, if you're familiar with scikit-learn, this should be fairly familiar to you too. Um, so in a nutshell, DiffPrivLib is a, it's a, a library for doing machine learning with differential privacy built right in. There's no expertise required. The user doesn't know, need to know anything about differential privacy or even data privacy to get up and running. Again, because of all of the default parameter settings and the very similar user experience. It's open source, it's up on GitHub. Uh, it's free to use and to modify to your heart's content. It's easy to install with pip um, and it's integrated again, as I said, with scikit-learn and NumPy to get you up and running quickly. And finally then it's easily integrated with any existing scripts. So typically if you have a, uh, a script that's running a bit of code for machine learning or data analytics. Um, in one or two lines of code, you should be able to replace the scikit-learn or the NumPy functions with their diff privilege equivalents, and the script should run as it did before, but with the added confidence now of it satisfying differential privacy. So before I dig into some code, um, we just have a quick look at the four main modules of diff privilege. The first of those is the mechanisms um, so a differentially private or a differential privacy mechanism is the, are the basic building blocks of differential privacy. They're the pieces of code that actually add the random noise to the data. Typically a user of DiffPrivLib won't actually come into contact with any mechanisms because they're all used under the hood um, in the tools and the models that we have to uh, achieve differential privacy. In essence, a mechanism is just a probability distribution from which, are, which we use to to add noise to the data. The next module then is the models module, which is the scikit-learn part of DiffPrivLib. Um, we have a, a number of um, machine learning models from scikit-learn that we have implemented with differential privacy, including things like logistic regression, linear regression, PCA, k-means. Um, and importantly, each of the models that we have inherits the, the scikit-learn equivalent as its parent class. And that gives us access to a lot of scikit-learn functionality for free. Um, and that makes it uh, much easier to use. Now we do have um, additional warnings that we, we 
push from diff privilege occasionally, one of those including the privacy leak warning that you see here. And I'll explain more about that when we move on to the notebooks shortly. The next module we have then is the tools module, which is the, the NumPy part of diff privilege. And this is a collection of kind of simple functions for data analytics tasks. Um, that includes mean, standard deviation, sum, count queries, and importantly, the histogram function as well, which is a very important function for differential privacy. It allows us to plot things like distributions and get counts of, of data sets in, um, in an efficient manner from a privacy perspective. And finally, then we have the accountant module, which is an accountant that keeps track of the privacy budget spend that I mentioned earlier. So you can see in this snippet of code, we have three queries run on a data set, each with an epsilon of 0.1. And then at the end, we add that up to be a total of 0.3, which is what you'd expect. But we also have capability for using advanced composition, composition techniques that if we give a little bit of slack in the, uh, the guarantee that differential privacy provides, we can get a big benefit in terms of the privacy budget that we spent. So in this plot here, we see that over 30 queries um, using what we call naive composition without any slack in our guarantee that we're spending more than 0 0.4 of our privacy budget but having a little slack in that guarantee allows us to reduce the spend to just over 0 0.2 so in essence this allows us to extract more knowledge for the same privacy guarantee so i'm going to move on to um some notebook demos now quickly I think for the next 10 minutes or so. So the first one of those is a quick 30 second introduction to Diff Privilib. Um, so to, this is simply uh, uh, we're going to train a Gaussian naive based classifier with uh, differential privacy. Um, we begin by importing the iris data set from using scikit-learn. We're then going to import our Gaussian naive based classifier from diffprivlib and uh, initialize it and train it using the fit method. As I said before, we have a, as we saw before, we have a privacy leak warning here. And that's because we haven't specified the bounds hyperparameter. And this uh, bounds hyperparameter uh, ensures that the model is uh, calibrated correctly. And without specifying it, what the model is going to do is actually going to read in that, that, that information from the data set, which constitutes a privacy leak um, above what we would expect from differential privacy. So that's why we have a warning here. And typically, you wouldn't want this to appear in your scripts. So we'll fix that uh, at the end of this script. As I also said before, um, each of our models inherits the scikit-learn class as its parent class. And you can see that here. We can, now that the model is trained, we can uh, classify unseen examples. So we're going to use the test data set for that. And you can see using the predict method, we have our classifications and we can then use the score function again um, from scikit-learn to uh, test the accuracy of the test data set. And we're at about 77%, which is pretty good for the size of the data set. So in this particular cell, what we're going to do is we're going to run our classifier for, a, 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 for various epsilon values. And in order to suppress our privacy leak warning, we're going to specify the bounds parameter upon initialization. And what the bounds does in this case is it specifies the, uh, the range in which the values in each column lie so as that the model can correctly calibrate the noise that it's going to add. Obviously, we're going to have to add a lot more noise to data that's spread over a wider range. And this parameter uh, fix or source that out in our model. We're then we're going to plot uh, the accuracy of this model across various epsilons on a log scale from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the 2. Obviously, because of the randomness involved, there's always going to be some fluctuation in the values. So these only give a single snapshot for each epsilon, but it's still a good test to see how we're doing. And then we're going to initialize the classifier with these parameters, the bounds and the epsilon value, and then fit it and test the accuracy of the model. And as we can see here, so for small epsilon, which is again a small privacy budget, 
we're getting quite uh, poor accuracy and a uh, very jagged curve. But as we increase our epsilon, as we increase the privacy budget, we're approaching 100% uh, accuracy at the top. And that's exactly what we would expect. So in the next notebook, we're going to run through a differentially private machine learning pipeline. Uh, this time we're going to use the adult data set from the UCI machine learning repository. Uh, we're going to import it using NumPy. There we go. And in order to construct a baseline, we're going to train a pipeline using scikit-learn to begin with, without any privacy. And here we have the pipeline is going to be composed of a standard scalar, which scales each column to have zero mean and unit variance. We're then going to reduce the dimensionality of the data set to have only two columns. And then we're going to feed that resulting data into a logistic regression, um, which is going to do our classification for us. In this case, the adult data set is a binary classification task. Um, and because DiffPrivLib is limited to using the LBFGS solver, we're going to use that same solver for this non-private version so that we're comparing like with like. So we're going to initialize the pipeline and then we're going to fit it and score it using our training data set and test data sets. And we see here that we have a, a baseline accuracy of 80%. So what we're now going to do is going to turn this particular non-private pipeline into a differentially private pipeline and parameterize it accordingly. So if you go down here, so we're going to import the models module from diffprivlib, and we have a standard scalar here, correctly parameterized with the bounds. We have a PCA, which is principal components analysis, reducing the dimension down to two. And then we have logistic regression classifier, uh, again, parameterized accordingly. For each of these, we're going to set the epsilon value to be one third. Um, which means the epsilon value for the entire pipeline when we add it up is going to be one. So we're going to initialize that and we're going to fit and score it. And as we can see here, we have an epsilon of almost 81%. So that compares quite favorably to the non-private pipeline, which was only 80.3%. It's not uncommon to see a higher accuracy from a differentially private model compared to a non-private model because of the noise that's been added it reduces overfitting um, as one consequence, which allows us to improve the accuracy as a byproduct. And in this cell then is simply doing a similar task to the previous notebook where we're running our model over various epsilon values. Um, I'm not gonna run that because it takes a bit too much time, but we can look at the results down here, uh, extracting them from pickle. And you can see here, we have, again, for small epsilon values, for a small privacy budget, we have very noisy results, but things start um, approaching our baseline accuracy at epsilon equals 0 0.1, which is a very good result in this particular case. And finally, then the last notebook I want to share is a quick data exploration workflow with DiffPrivLib. I'm going to uh, run all of this code. Uh, so we begin by importing NumPy, diffprivlib, and matplotlib for all of our plotting. In this case, we're going to use our budget account in this time to take uh, keep track of our budget spend across the script. And we're going to use an epsilon of 0 0.04 for each of our queries. In this case, so we have initialized our budget account and to have a an epsilon value of up to one. So here we're gonna use the cover type data set from scikit-learn um, and we're gonna do a little bit of pre-processing on the data set here. And then we have our column names and the ranges of each column, which we're going to use later on when we're specifying bounds for each uh, query. As I said before, the um, histogram function is very important in differential privacy and very efficient. So we can use the histogram function in this case to see, have a look at the distribution of the labels in this data set. So we can see here that approximately 50% of the examples in this data set are associated with label number two, um, and about 35% with label number one. Again, all of these queries have 
a little bit of random noise because of the differential privacy guarantees that we have. Um, but for the size of the data set, uh, these results are quite accurate and reliable. We can extend our uh, analysis of the distributions of the data to the features of the data set as well. So this is all of the columns of the data set. Um, again, using the histogram function here to access the data. And these are the results that we get. So we can see there is, um, we can get a good visualization of the type of data that we're dealing with using these particular functions. And now is probably a good time to have a look at our accountant to see how much privacy budget we've spent so far. So we can see here, we have a total spend of uh, 0.52. And using the len function, then we see that we've executed 13 queries, which correspond to the 12 queries here and the, the one query previously. So we can also use uh, two dimensional histograms to get even more insight from data. And in this case, we're plotting the distribution of each um, of three features here, as well as their uh, distribution of labels. And that's using the histogram 2D function, again, similar to the NumPy equivalent. We can extend that to uh, plotting uh, features against other features, again, using the two, two dimensional histogram function here. Um, in this case, we're plotting the horizontal distance to hydrology on the x-axis, and then using our colors, we're using horizontal distance to roadways. And another way then to compare features on two dimensions is to use color maps, again, which we execute using the two-dimensional histogram. And finally, then we have our more simple queries if we're looking to hone in on, on specific uh, features of the data using our mean, variance, count none, and count none zero as well. And you can see then at the end, we can examine our total privacy loss. And if we have any other queries to execute, we can use uh, the remaining method to find out how much privacy budget we have to spend. So uh, before I finish, uh, here are some additional resources for you if you want to learn more. So all of our code is available on our GitHub repository on the um, IBM domain. And that includes all of the notebooks that I presented here today and other notebooks as well. Our documentation is hosted on Read the Docs. And I guess most importantly, if you want to get started with DiffPrivLib, then uh, one line command in your terminal pip install DiffPrivLib and you'll be away. So that's all I have for you today. Um, Hopefully we'll have some time for some questions if there's any going. Yeah, we do. We have four minutes uh, for questions. Great. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have any questions. No. Everything must have been perfectly clear. <laughs> oh, we have a question. Oh, great. All right. Uh, is it possible to set up differential privacy so that you could reverse it in the future if you needed to, or is it a one-way process? So typically what you do is you have the raw data set in a secure environment and you can publish differentially private statistics on that. Um, there are other techniques. So for example, um, Apple uses what we call local differential privacy, which means the differential privacy is applied before the data even leaves your device. And that means that the data controller only ever sees uh, random no randomly uh, or um, data that has been randomized and in that case you can't reverse engineer it but typically if the data is valuable then you would keep a raw copy of it in a secure environment and only release uh, queries on it using differential privacy okay that's awesome uh, also uh, just a little help for me could you unshare your screen if possible yes i can uh, there we go okay thank you all, all right so this is the next question what happens if the budget account runs out so the, in an ideal scenario, the idea is that you have a fixed privacy budget for a data set. And once the budget runs out, the data is destroyed. Um, clearly, that's not realistic in, in, in today's world. So a lot of the time you would give, for example, the idea is that you would give a single data analyst a fixed privacy budget to spend on a data set. 
And once that budget has been spent, the access to that data set is revoked. Um, so that would be the modern interpretation of that. Okay, awesome. So the next question, you are inheriting from SK Learns classes. If they modify, how do you guarantee that your code maintains compatibility? Uh, that requires updating of the code, uh, as simple as. So typically, uh, a lot of the time, the last two, I think 22 and 23, we've had to push out patches um, the following day for changes that Scikit-Learn have made. So it's just an ongoing process of keeping it up to date. Awesome. Uh, what is the point of privacy differential? Could you be more specific and suggest a few using a scenario? So the, as I mentioned in the talk, the differential privacy was conceived because of the failings of traditional anonymization methods. And um, differential privacy isn't perfect, but it works very well when you have a lot of data, um, a lot of sensitive data, and when... Um, sorry, I'm not losing my train of thought. <laughs> um, so th th there are very specific circumstances where differential privacy is very useful, but we still need to use our traditional anonymization methods to safeguard against, um, against data risk. Okay, that's awesome. I think right now we're out of time. Thank you Perfect. for your talk. Uh, you can actually reach out to the breakout room. We actually have a few more questions. You can answer it there. And also this is for you.